Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Saturday, everybody. Today's video is primarily about the housing crisis, which may be mutating into a more dangerous form, and risking some believe a financial or banking crisis. There are other developments that we need to cover as well. Uh, including a further examination of yesterday's economic data, so I may end up doing an extra special video for you guys tomorrow on Sunday, which is normally a day off. My apologies for having too much、uh, too much China update on the weekend, but for today, let's focus primarily on the housing crisis. In June, China's property prices fell for the tenth month, once again reminding us, the market, and frustrated regulators, how government easing efforts are failing to stabilize. The industry, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, yesterday new home prices in 70 cities dropped 0.1 percent in June, month on month. Now, even if these numbers were accurate, we remember too that many local governments have adopted formal and informal tools to essentially prevent new home prices from falling. Since the beginning of the year, we remember the central government has instructed local governments to prevent prices from falling. This de facto price. Floor is likely exacerbating the collapse in sales we have seen every month this year, making it difficult for cash-strapped developers to move assets and open up liquidity. Indeed, as we observed last month, some developers have tried to get around restrictions by accepting wheat and other commodities above market prices for apartments. Home sales have fallen for 11 straight months. That's the longest slump since China created a private property market in the late 1990s. In the first half of this year, property sales plummeted 72 percent versus the same period last year. As we will explore in a moment, contagion is spreading to the financial system as a rapidly growing number of home buyers are refusing to pay mortgages for incomplete apartments. In the past year, 28 of the top 100 developers have defaulted or asked their debt holders for extensions. As such, analysts with Bloomberg this week are warning that crisis hit developers, the wider development industry, is reaching a new dangerous phase with a debt sell-off. Expanding to firms once deemed safe from the cash crunch, including Country Garden Holdings Co Limited, the largest builder in the country by sales. But of course, like I just alluded to, the big news for the Chinese housing industry this week is the sudden expanding number of home buyers in China refusing to pay for mortgages on properties that have brought, but developers simply cannot finish. Further smashing the already shaken confidence in the sector and increasing wider financial risks. We have been following this closely for the last few days. Over the years, major Chinese developers like Evergrande and Country Garden Holdings Limited developed the so-called pre-sales model, where apartments are bought long before they are completed. Now, the crisis hit developers do not have the money to finish these projects, and home buyers are not happy about it. Independent research platform. Plenum China published a special note on these developments, arguing that while this is an issue, the crisis is manageable. The firm expressed that the direct impact of the mortgage strike on the banks is quite small. Total outstanding bank loans are approximately 212 trillion RMB. Mortgage loans account for 18% of the total loans at 39 trillion RMB. They estimate that the number of people with a mortgage is likely to range from 40 to 100 million people. The firm continued to write in their note that 100 residential projects facing repayment boycotts probably represent about 100,000 households, which is a tiny portion of the total number of people with mortgages, and their outstanding mortgage loans are probably no more than 100 billion RMB, representing a tiny share of the total nationwide mortgage amount. Even if the number of boycotters grows, By ten times, the impact on the banking system would still be limited. Most Chinese home buyers need to pay a deposit of at least thirty percent when they take out a mortgage, which gives the banks a decent buffer. This is a sensible position. However, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development met with financial regulators and major Chinese banks late this week to discuss the mortgage boycotts. And as we remember from yesterday, China's top banking regulator announced that the government would guarantee that houses are delivered on time. This suggests, at the very least, that the government is concerned by what they are seeing. 
These mortgage strikes or boycotts are spreading like wildfire too. Two days ago, we thought it was 35 to 50 projects affected. Yesterday, that climbed to 100. Now it looks like buyers of more than 230 projects across 86 cities are collectively refusing to make mortgage payments for unfinished pre-sold units. While it's not clear how many home buyers are not repaying mortgages, according to Jeffrey's Financial Group Co., delayed projects make up about 1% of China's total mortgage balance. Nonetheless, China has never seen anything like this. And in the lead up to the global financial crisis, the mainstream view at the time in the US was that issues in the mortgage market were small and manageable. According to Autonomous Research, exposure to the property sector represents 62 trillion RMB, 9.2 trillion US dollars for banks, with half of this in the form of mortgage loans. Mortgages can represent up to 20% of total assets for banks, including of some of China's national champion state-run banks. So we can see that this is very much an ongoing development. The government, regulators, and some analysts are concerned, but analysts are debating very much whether this is a smaller manageable issue or whether this will build into a wider crisis. Of course, only time will tell, and we will be following this very closely. What I did want to end on, though, was this quote from one former investment banker who worked at Lehman Brothers in New York in 2008. Quote, Unless President Xi Jinping's government stops the stampede, a collapse of the banking system on the scale of Lehman Brothers holdings in 2008 is very much in the cards. China is unprepared for such a big chunk of its bank loans to go sour. In 2008, I worked at Lehman Brothers in New York and witnessed firsthand how the subprime mortgage crisis dragged down the venerable bank and threatened the entire industry. This environment is starting to feel eerily similar. End quote. Hey guys, if you're appreciating this sort of content, don't forget to hit the like button. And for anyone who wants to go the extra mile and help me keep China Update and these sort of videos sustainable, it's just me making these videos, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. This is a great way to help me continue making this sort of content. As always, thank you so much everybody for the ongoing support. After almost two weeks without any public appearances, General Secretary Xi Jinping had a surprise visit to Urumqi and two smaller cities in Xinjiang this week. This is the first time that the General Secretary has visited the large territory in the west of the country in eight years. With his last trip being Hong Kong, both visits are sending messages both domestically and to an audience overseas. The major theme of Xi's speeches in Urumqi was ethnic unity, with state-run Xinhua writing, quote, She said that as a united multi-ethnic country, China boasts harmonious relationships between its diverse, interwoven ethnic groups. He said that all ethnic groups enjoy equality, unity, and progress under the socialist system, stressing that the party's theories and policies concerning ethnic groups are sound and have produced the desired effect. End quote. Xi Jinping concluded with expressing, quote, Ethnic unity is the lifeline of all ethnic groups in the country, and all ethnic groups in Xinjiang are inseparable members of the big family of the Chinese race. End quote. This can also be translated as Chinese nation. Another major theme of his speeches was the Belt and Road Initiative. Xinjiang, home to many non-Han ethnic groups, most notably the Uyghurs and Kazakhs, was one of the last major pieces of territory conquered by the Manchu Qing dynasty, the last imperial dynasty of what the West has long called China. The 20th century saw large-scale Han migration into Xinjiang, and as such, ethnic tensions in the region remain an acute issue. Hence, Xi's emphasis on ethnic unity. The above-quoted Xinhua article was also written in English, suggesting a state media attempt to respond to years-long concerns from many, mostly Western countries, of extreme human rights abuses and forced labor in the region. That is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. There may be a special video, a special episode tomorrow on Sunday, if that is the case. I'll see you tomorrow.